Hi everybody, it's Tim, and this is What I Saw, When I Saw, Detour. This movie, released in 1945, is widely considered a film noir classic, and my primary goal here was to record a commentary that is not longer than the movie itself, which is a hair over an hour long. Directing the movie Detour is Edgar G. Ulmer, who, among many other films, also directed the movie The Black Cat. I have a video about that movie, if you're interested. I won't be comparing the 1945 version of Detour with its 1998 remake, but I will be talking a little bit about the original 1939 novel, Detour. As with all the videos about movies that I make, I'm not arguing that my interpretation of this movie is the only correct interpretation, nor am I suggesting that what I see reflects the original intention of the writer and filmmakers. All right, buckle up, my friends. <laughs> Let's get this show on the road. On the road of life, you may take a detour to enjoy a more scenic route toward your destination, or to stop and enjoy an attraction along the way. More often, though, we are compelled to take a detour because of some obstacle or complication ahead, and we must take a roundabout way that we hadn't planned on. This movie is concerned with the latter, as we shall see. Each of our four principal characters is trying to get somewhere, and for nearly all of them, something disruptive happens along the way. The movie begins with the image of a highway, but it is not the open road unfolding ahead of us. It is a rear view of the road disappearing behind us. It is a retrospective view, which is appropriate to the fact that most of our story here is told in flashback, in memory. The use of flashback is, I believe, a critically important creative choice for this film. Detour could have started in New York City with our main characters and proceeded in a linear fashion, but it does not. The movie starts where it ends. More on that to come. When we first meet our protagonist, Al Roberts, he walks into a diner, which is a converted railway car. So we have another suggestion of transit, but it's a method of transit that isn't going anywhere. Al is withdrawn and surly, and then, to use a word that they did not have in 1945, he is triggered by a song on the jukebox, a ballad of low self-esteem called I Can't Believe That You're In Love With Me. This was a popular song in its day. Prior to the release of this film, the song was recorded by Louis Armstrong, Artie Shaw, and Ella Fitzgerald. Tight shot on Al's sweaty, weathered, unshaven face, and so begins the flashback. Now we see a different Al Roberts, clean, well-dressed, playing piano with a small orchestra in a New York City nightclub called The Break o' Dawn, presumably, as Al tells us, because it's open until 4 a.m. Al is in love with the singer Sue Harvey, and in his narration, Al tells us, all in all, I was a pretty lucky guy. Well, then life appears to be pretty good. Or perhaps it's flattened out into a plateau or a circle. Smooth driving, but not leading anywhere. Sue Harvey clearly feels that way. She calls the Break of Dawn Club a dump and a flea bag, which sounds like a self-justifying exaggeration. I, I don't know too many dumps that have waiters in white jackets and such a well-dressed clientele. Be that as it may, when Al walks Sue home, she tells Al that she is going to leave New York City for Hollywood. Notice that Sue doesn't say what she wants to do in Hollywood. Act, sing, be an assistant to Jack Warner. Sue only says she wants to try her luck as if she's going to Atlantic City or Las Vegas. Without even thinking about it, Al calls her dream the most stupid thing I've ever heard of. Some boyfriend. Al tells Sue that a million people 
are already trying to pursue that dream. But that clearly doesn't matter to Sue. Instead of arguing the point with Al, Sue just tells him matter-of-factly that she is going, and that's that. Now, we only know what the movie tells us. And this movie doesn't tell us that there is anything tying Al Roberts to New York City. He doesn't say he's under contract to play at the nightclub. He doesn't say he has a sick mother to tend to or other family obligations. So what's keeping Al from telling this woman he loves, this woman he claims he wants to marry, well, honey, I'll I'll come to Hollywood with you. It could be that the only thing stopping Al Roberts from doing that is a giant obstacle called Al Roberts. Earlier, we see that Sue is very supportive of Al, telling him that one day he'll play Carnegie Hall. But Al replies cynically that the only way he'll get to Carnegie Hall is as a janitor. Al not only mocks Sue's dream, he mocks Sue's dream for him. We don't know why Al feels this way. Maybe Al puts himself down so he can feel Sue rush in and pick him back up again. Al may not think much of his own talent, or he has no ambition. Maybe it's a combination of all those things. But one thing is for sure. Sue's discussion of her plans, her dreams, does not elicit in Al a declaration of any plans or dreams that he has beyond getting married to Sue. Sue says she wants to marry Al too, but only when they've made it good. She says that they, as performers, are in the bush leagues and are struck out. This anticipates a baseball metaphor that Vera makes later on in the film. It's understandable for Sue, as a performer, to want to improve her lot in life, but what does that have to do with love? Isn't marriage for richer and for poorer? Very likely, Sue believes that if she gets married now, to Al or to anyone else, she'll have to give up singing and become a housewife and start having kids. But Sue Harvey honors her talent. She believes in it. She believes in herself. She is going to make a beeline for Hollywood with no detours. Al protests a little, but he doesn't fight very hard, really at all, to keep Sue. He just shrugs and says, okay. He gives her a perfunctory kiss goodnight or goodbye, and he disappears into the fog with a sullen so long. It's an early sign of Al's passivity that we will see more of. Al likes to talk like a tough guy, but when he's challenged, he folds pretty quickly. He gives in. Time passes. We don't know how much time. And we see Al alone playing piano at the Break of Dawn Club. And it's clear that Al is no slouch as a musician. Why, he doesn't even look at his hands as he plays variations on Brahms' Waltz Opus 39 in A-flat major. A patron of the club, hearing this performance sends Al a $10 tip. Now, this movie takes place, presumably, in the 1940s. The relative value of that tip today is at least $185. So let's call it an even 200, two bills. Al takes the money, and he nods to the patron as if he'd just been tipped a quarter. In his narration, Al says... So when this drunk handed me a ten spot after a request, I couldn't get too excited. Al calls the money a piece of paper crawling with germs, adding, it couldn't buy anything I wanted. Well, the man who tipped Al does not appear to be drunk, and no drunk that I've ever met requests Brahms at a nightclub. Al doesn't even question why someone would give him nearly $200 in a tip. He may not want to think about that, because clearly the customer was sending the money to Al as a way of saying, hey, you're better than this place. Take this money and do something with your talent. 
which Al does, or he seems to anyway. He makes a long-distance call to Sue in California, telling her that he's coming out there and then they'll be married. What Al does not say to Sue or to us in his narration is that he's going to Hollywood to play piano or go to music school or to teach or to compose. He's not following his dream. He's just tagging along after Sue. This is the beginning of Al Roberts' detour because he is not thinking about himself, about his responsibility to his own talent and to his own life, He's just following his girlfriend like a puppy dog. Let's see where that detour takes him. How is Al going to get to California? Well, how would anyone in New York get to California? This is either the late 1930s or 1940s. Commercial airline travel is not as popular as it is today, and evidently Al does not own a car. Well, he could take the train. Then, as now... There is no direct train line from New York City to Los Angeles, so Al would have had to take the train from New York to, say, Chicago, then change lines for a direct train to the West Coast. But it appears that Al cannot even afford that, so he hitchhikes. Now, let's pause a moment on this. Al says in his narration that he hawked everything he owned, and he still doesn't have enough money to take the train, even part of the way. Is that plausible? Even given the $10 or $200 in today's money that Al received as a tip? It is possible, I think. I tried to find out online how much a train ticket from Manhattan to Los Angeles would have cost in the 1940s. The best estimate I could find was that New York to Chicago would be about $50, which is a thousand dollars in today's money. Maybe Al just doesn't have that kind of scratch, as they used to say. So he thumbs it. Nevertheless, it's worth noting that if Al got as far as Chicago, he could have found short-term work there as a piano player. He could work, save money, then take the train to the West Coast. It's around this point in the movie that we've kind of forgotten that Al is a very talented pianist. Maybe he's forgotten that, too. And another thing. If it costs that much money to get from New York to California, where did Sue Harvey get the money? Sue doesn't appear to be anything more than an ordinary singer attached to a band in a small club, and she doesn't mention having a benefactor, a an angel investor, or even a rich aunt who left her a lot of money. The most likely explanation in the context of this movie is that Sue saved her money and that she had been planning to go to Hollywood long before she broke the news to Al. That's not just saving for yourself. That's investing in yourself. We're not told how long Al has been traveling, but when he gets to Arizona, he is picked up by Charlie Haskell Jr., who says he's going all the way to Los Angeles. Charlie has plans, he tells Al, to bet on a horse. Charlie, then, is like Sue Harvey. He has direction, he has purpose, and he has a specific destination with an eye to increase his fortunes. Charlie tells Al that he's been booking horses for 20 years, That means Charlie is a bookmaker. He is licensed, one would hope, to collect bets from other gamblers to make wagers on their behalf. It is a little curious. If Charlie is a bookmaker, he wouldn't have to go to the race in Los Angeles in person to place his bet. He could contact another bookmaker in L.A. and make the bet that way. Maybe Charlie doesn't know another bookmaker there. We don't know for sure. Yet. Unfortunately, there is a detour ahead for Charlie, known as death. On two occasions on the drive, Charlie takes his pills. If we believe that Charlie has a heart attack, those may be nitroglycerin pills, which relax blood vessels and increase the flow of blood and oxygen to the heart. It is possible, though, 
to eventually damage your heart with nitroglycerin pills. Charlie appears to die while Al is driving the car one night. And when Charlie's body tumbles out of his car, he hits his head on a rock. He is dead. Poor Charlie. He was headed to the City of Angels to bet on a horse named Paradisiacal, a horse named after heaven. We don't know for sure what killed Charlie Haskell, but Al is afraid that the police will think he murdered Charlie, and Al doesn't have enough faith in himself or in other people that the truth will bear him out. I guess Al doesn't believe in autopsies either. So, worrying that the police will suspect him of foul play, Al engages in foul play. <laughs> he hides Charlie's body, assumes his identity, takes his money, takes his clothes, steals his car, and proceeds to California. Further on down the road, Al stops at a motel to rest, and there he discovers that Charlie has $768 in his billfold. Ladies and gentlemen, that is about $11,000 in today's money. If you needed more proof that Al Roberts is not very bright, he could have left Charlie's body slumped over where it was. Anyone discovering it would think that Charlie, needing to take a leak, was trying to exit safely via the passenger side of his car when he had a heart attack, fell out, and hit his head on a rock. Al could have taken half of the eleven grand from Charlie's wallet and bought himself a bus or a train ticket for the rest of the way to Los Angeles. And even if the police did track down Al Roberts from having been seen earlier with Charlie at the diner, Al could have said, well, we were just having a meal together, or Charlie dropped me off miles ahead of the point where his body was found. But now, Al has a plan. He has a purpose. He has direction. He's going to pose as Charlie Haskell to get by the state line inspectors, drive to Los Angeles, ditch the car, become Al Roberts again, find Sue Harvey, and all will be well. Right? Wrong. Wrong. <laughs> Al, for some unknown reason, decides to pick up a hitchhiker, a woman who says her name is Vera, and who, as it almost unbelievably happens, was picked up and dropped off earlier by Charlie Haskell, and who now thinks Al murdered Charlie for his money. So, to speed through the rest of the plot, Vera blackmails Al into her scheme to sell the car, posing as Mr. and Mrs. Haskell. And when Vera learns that the very wealthy Charlie Haskell Sr. is near death and is looking for his estranged son, she pressures Al into a bigger scheme to pose as Charlie Jr. and claim his inheritance. Al and Vera fight in their rented room. Vera is accidentally strangled on the phone cord. And now Al has two dead bodies in his wake, and he is even more convinced that no one will believe him if he told the truth of what happened. Al leaves the scene, and, an undetermined time later, he arrives at the diner where we found him at the start of the movie. The movie forms a circle, a path on which you go nowhere. Let's return to the issue of money, shall we? <laughs> Charlie Haskell tells Al that at the Santa Anita horse track, he is going to bet on the horse paradisiacal. He does not tell Al the amount of his bet. Vera tells Al later that the bet was going to be $3,000. Now that is a big bet. In today's money, $3,000 is about $50,000. But all Charlie Haskell appears to have on him is $768. That's still a lot of money, but it isn't 3000 So where's the rest of the money? The most likely explanation is that Charlie, as a bookmaker, was going to raise the balance of the money when he arrived in Los Angeles. This doesn't seem to occur to either Al or to Vera. What also doesn't occur to either Al or Vera 
is that instead of putting their chips on a scheme that will almost certainly fail, Al passing himself off to the Haskell family as their long-lost relation, they could have taken Charlie Haskell's money and bet it on the horse that Charlie had the tip on. Charlie told Al and Vera that the race was at Santa Anita, and he even told them the name of the horse. That plan had a greater likelihood of success, unless you're greedy and you want millions instead of thousands. When Al and Charlie stop at a roadside restaurant to eat, Charlie tells Al that he once lost $38,000 at a horse track in Miami. That is a lot of money. That is about $600,000 today. Al's response is, tough luck. But Charlie says, I'm supposed to be the smart one. And there you have the difference between Al and Charlie. Al thinks the loss is due to luck, some cosmic force that operates independently of human agency, while Charlie thinks he just didn't use his head. Charlie also shows us that he is not someone easily discouraged by loss. Loss is part of life. It's part of gambling. In fact, the loss only motivates Charlie to make good, to make more money. Al Roberts, in contrast, attributes events to luck or fate. When Al picks up Vera at the gas station, he says, It was just my luck picking her up on the road. Luck? Dude, it was you! <laughs> you decided to pick her up. You didn't have to. No one made you do it. Picking up anyone along the way would have made them a witness, connecting Charlie Haskell's car with someone fitting Al Roberts's physical description. It wasn't bad luck. It was a choice that Al made. And if you don't understand yourself, you don't understand why you make the choices that you do. You just act and chalk up the outcome to fate. Personally, I think you could also make the case that Al Roberts either hates or is afraid of money. He calls it the stuff you never have enough of, and the stuff that's caused more trouble in the world than anything we ever invented, simply because there's too little of it. Today we would say that Al Roberts operates from a mindset of scarcity, of limits. That kind of person will never be a gambler. Maybe that is why, in part, Al never capitalizes on his talent to make a lot of money. He doesn't trust himself to reap the rewards. Charlie bets on a horse. Sue Harvey bets on herself. And Al, well, he tries to improvise his way through life in the hopes that his luck will pan out or that fate will be kind to him. Vera, meanwhile, is an opportunist. She tells Al that life is like a ball game. You have to take a swing at whatever comes along before you wake up and realize it's the ninth inning. Vera has energy, she has no filter, and she isn't afraid to bark orders at a man. She could be the ringleader of a criminal enterprise were it not for the fact that she jumps at a scheme that is far-fetched, to say the least. She doesn't use her head, not in the way that, say, Charlie Haskell might evaluate the difference between a sure thing and a long shot. Al warns Vera not to be greedy because, he says, this will lead to a downfall, like Caesar. I don't know that greed was Caesar's main problem. <laughs> and coming from Al, a warning about greed is a little suspect. Remember that Al warns Sue about going to Hollywood because a million other people are doing it, and talent, Al argued, has nothing to do with success. Well, we know that that is not true. But if you don't believe in yourself, you're not going to have faith that anything you do will bear fruit. Al doesn't believe that anyone will believe him if he tells the truth, and he doesn't believe Sue can succeed as an actress. Well, what does he believe? Al believes that fate has it in for us all.
we know that that is not true. Some people succeed and some people don't. But if you hate yourself, if you fail to honor your gifts and abilities, and you don't want to take responsibility for your life, you are much more likely to believe that the fault, dear Brutus, is in the stars and not in ourselves. Al's parting words to us at the end of the movie are that fate or some mysterious force can put the finger on you or on me for no good reason at all. In the novel, the line is, God or fate or some mysterious force can put the finger on you and me for no good reason at all. Obviously, the Hayes Code clipped the word God out of that sentiment. But even without God, that sentiment sounds very much like fatalism, a belief that all events are governed by fate or by destiny, and that events are inevitable. An absurdist worldview would add that these events happen for no reason. Well, to be sure, some events in life are beyond our control, but what is always within our control is how we react or respond to those events. When Al and Charlie are driving together, Al notices the scratches on Charlie's hand, and Charlie explains that he had an encounter with a tomato that he picked up as a hitchhiker. Clearly, Charlie expected some sexual favor in return for giving this woman a lift, and when the woman refused his advances, he told her to take the yacht of Duffy, sister. Yeah, which means, <laughs> which means get out of the car and walk, because, as we all know, in 1902, American athlete Arthur F. Duffy set the world record for the 100-meter dash. Yeah. Well, this, of course, sets up the appearance of Vera later on in the movie, but it got me thinking. Charlie does not have to tell Al the truth about where he got the scars. He could just make something up a convincing or even implausible lie, just to keep distance between him and Al. After all, they don't know anything about each other. But Charlie tells Al the truth in a way that men try to connect with each other. Indeed, Charlie goes further and shows Al a bigger scar on his arm, one that Al would never have seen. Charlie says that when he was younger, he and another kid were playing with his father's Franco-Prussian sabers. The other kid, Charlie says, cut his arm, and Charlie, overcome by anger or adrenaline or fear, jabbed and took out the other kid's eye. Charlie claims that, well, it was just an accident, but because he was young and afraid, he packed up his bags and ran away from home as his father who had nearly clocked him or struck him for what he'd done, was calling the doctor. So, like Al, Charlie does something bad, and fear compels him to run away. Or so it seems. Charlie finishes the story by saying that he hasn't been home for 15 or 16 years. Okay, <laughs> wait a minute. Charlie also told Al that he'd been booking horses for 20 years. And at the California State Line checkpoint, the police officer reads Charlie's driver's license and says he's 30 years old. So, <laughs> Charlie was booking horses when he was 10? And he was doing that before the sword fighting incident, which happened when he was 15? This is almost certainly a continuity error. But... Within the context of the movie, it's another element of uncertainty. When Al is going through Charlie's suitcase in the motel, he reads an unsent letter that Charlie had written to his father. In this letter, so Al tells us, Charlie claims to be a salesman selling hymnals. And Al takes this as evidence that Charlie must be some kind of chiseler. Al thinks that Charlie was going to raise a new stake for his book in Miami by rooking his old man. In other words, Charlie planned to cheat his father out of money to raise funds 
that he would use to bet on horses in Miami. That is quite a projection. For all we know, Charlie is a salesman. And remember, the newspaper with the item about Charlie Haskell Sr. nearing death and looking for his son was in the glove compartment of Charlie Jr.'s car. That article describes Charlie Sr. as a noted sports enthusiast and president of the San Pedro Exporting Company. San Pedro is a neighborhood in Los Angeles, California. The Santa Anita Racetrack is in Arcadia, which is a city 13 miles northeast of downtown Los Angeles. Charlie Haskell Jr. knew that his father was ill. Was he going to Los Angeles to bet on a horse? Or was he going to see his father? We don't know for certain. In a sad coincidence, the actor Edmund MacDonald, who played Charlie Haskell, died six years after making Detour. He had a stroke and died of a brain aneurysm. He is buried in Los Angeles. Now, if taking out the other kid's eye really was an accident, why did Charlie leave home and never return? He can't be on the run from the law because he gives his real name to Al Roberts. His driver's license says Charlie Haskell. Once again, we only know what the movie decides to tell us. We don't know for sure if Charlie got that big scar from a sword. We don't know if he was sword fighting with a kid or with someone else, say his father. And we don't know the real reason why Charlie left home. It could just as easily be the case that Charlie's father kicked him out of the house because he didn't approve of his son being a bookmaker. And for all we know, Charlie got the big scar on his arm from another woman he tried to make the moves on. Regardless, Charlie did not have to show Al that large scar on his forearm. What was he trying to do? Impress some hitchhiker? Intimidate him? Charlie opens up quite a bit to Al. He shows him his scar, he buys him dinner, and he tells Al that when Al makes his first million, he can buy him dinner, despite the fact that Al, to our knowledge, has said nothing to Charlie about any plans to make big money when he gets to Los Angeles. Now, I'm not suggesting that Charlie Haskell was cruising Al Roberts and would expect some kind of favor from Al for driving him all the way from Arizona to Los Angeles. We'll never know. And you could say that it's that uncertainty, that mystery, that adds to the sinister quality of film noir. If we don't know for sure what's true about Charlie and what isn't, we can also say the same about Al. The screenplay for the movie Detour was written by Martin M. Goldsmith, the author of the 1939 novel Detour, which is subtitled An Extraordinary Tale. The etymology of the word tale is something that is told, so that makes sense for this movie because Al tells us his own story. But the word tale has a particular shade of meaning. We think of tall tales, a whale of a tale, or fishing tales, a story that is not entirely true and may be completely false. Is what we're seeing here true? Did it really happen this way? The movie is narrated by Al Roberts. This is his voice telling his own story. But who is he talking to? He's not confessing to a priest. He's not telling this tale to the owner of the diner or to the trucker on the stool next to him. Al uses the second person, you, as in, did you ever want to forget anything? How many of you would believe he fell out of the car? And I know you wouldn't believe me, as if he is talking to someone else. But in the movie, he is not. Al Roberts, a character in a movie, is talking to us, the audience. We are the you he refers to. Al is talking through the fourth wall of the movie, as if he knows there is an audience watching 
and listening to him. In my opinion, this element of artifice very subtly calls into question whether the story that Al is telling us is at all true. When we see Al Roberts at the start and end of this movie, there are no objective markers to confirm anything he tells us. We don't know where Al has come from. We don't know where he's headed. We don't even know for sure if he knows how to play the piano. He's just a moody, anxious drifter traveling on foot. Had this movie started in New York City with Al and Sue at the Break of Dawn Club, then proceeded in a linear fashion through its plot, we, the audience, would take what we see unfolding as reality, as what really happened. But because Detour is told in flashback, and because in its bookended scenes with Al in the diner, we have no objective indications that anything Al is saying is true, we are compelled not only to question the reality of what we're seeing, but also to ask ourselves what we think and believe about the philosophies these characters espouse. Whether or not we agree with Al that fate puts the finger on us all depends on whether we believe anything he says. There are two scenes in Detour where Al Roberts calls Sue Harvey on the telephone. The first time, he calls her from the Break of Dawn Club in New York City, and the second time, near the end of the movie, he is, like Sue, in California. He's calling her from the room that he's renting with Vera. Sue's phone number is Crestview 65723. On both occasions, Al has this number committed to memory. The number makes sense because Crestview is a neighborhood in Los Angeles, only about six miles from Hollywood. What is curious, though, is that we never see Sue Harvey give Al this telephone number. Well, you might say, maybe, maybe Sue gave it to him at the start of the movie at some point while they were walking together in the fog, and we just don't see it. But in that scene, Sue only tells Al that she's going to Hollywood. She doesn't tell him where she's going to stay, or with who, or for how long. And maybe she doesn't know. Either way, Sue does not invite Al to come with her. And she is not specific on details on when they'll be together again. She only tells Al, maybe someday he'll come out to California later on. Now, lots of men... <laughs> would have taken that lack of specificity to mean, adios, adios amigo, it's been fun. So how does Al have Sue's phone number? Well, we don't know because the movie doesn't tell us. Al does say near the end of the movie that Sue had written to him. Well, maybe she gave the number to him in a letter. But what we do know is that the first time Al calls Sue on the phone, we don't hear her speak. Al speaks into the phone as if he is talking to her, but all we see is one shot of Sue smiling, holding the receiver. We don't hear her say anything. When Al tells Sue that he's coming to California, he says, no, don't try to stop me, just expect me. Now, what did Sue say to prompt that? We don't know. Then, when Al says that he wants to marry Sue right away once he arrives, there's a pause, and Al says, That's the stuff. That's what I've been waiting to hear you say. Then he blows little kisses into the phone, which is more lover boy than we have ever or will ever see Al being. On this call, Al is very supportive of Sue, who is supposedly slinging hash in a restaurant. Al tells Sue to stick it out to keep going to casting calls. That is quite a different tune from calling Sue's dream stupid and asking her if she's thought about how her dream affects him. Earlier in New York, Sue said that she would marry Al only when she'd made it big. 
But now Sue is ready to marry Al, even though she's working in a restaurant slinging hash? Did this call really happen? Or is this the kind of call Al wanted, in his imagination, to have? When Al calls Sue a second time in California, all Sue says is, Hello? Hello? Notice, in both phone call scenes, Sue is wearing the exact same outfit, she's wearing the same charm bracelet, her hair is done in the same way. What are we to make of that? That Sue Harvey owns only one blouse? Or that the filmmakers were short on money, they couldn't afford a different shot of Sue Harvey sitting in a chair holding the phone? What we are seeing is the theater of Al's memory. I submit to you the possibility that Al doesn't have Sue Harvey's phone number, and perhaps that Sue Harvey doesn't exist at all. And if she doesn't exist, maybe Al Roberts was never a piano player in a bar in New York. Again, at the beginning and the end of this movie, we don't see anything to confirm what Al has told us this entire time. He doesn't, for example, sit at the diner and take out Charlie Haskell's driver's license to look at it. He doesn't take out any of the money that he stole from Charlie. He doesn't try to call Sue Harvey from the diner. From all appearances, at the beginning and the end of this movie, Al Roberts is just a drifter, a guy with a short fuse and a nihilistic outlook who accounts for his situation in life with a wild story. Tragically, he is like many people on the road of life who don't take responsibility for themselves. I said at the beginning of this video that the creative choice to tell the story in flashback was critically important. Flashback is memory, and woven into the fabric of memory are elements of uncertainty, ambiguity, missing information, and unanswered questions. The most unsettling thing about Detour isn't that we live, as Al Roberts suggests, in a universe where something called fate can put the finger on you or stick out its foot at any time. It's that no matter what happens, there will always be things we never know or understand. We never learn where Vera was coming from or where she was headed and why. We don't even learn her last name or if Vera was her real name. She tells Al, you can call me Vera. Charlie and Vera's murder may never be solved. Sue Harvey may never find out why Al Roberts never made it to California or what became of him. Al Roberts will never know what would have happened in his life if he had just told the truth or if he had told himself that in life he didn't have to just go along with what someone else wanted. The movie ends where it started. It forms a circle, a circle in which Al Roberts is trapped. A racetrack is a closed loop, like a circle, but in a horse race, there is a winner. Sue Harvey wanted to get to Hollywood, and she succeeded. She is the first one there. And even if it's true that for the time being she is slinging hash, at least she got to her destination. Now, there's some ambiguity at the end of this movie as to whether Al Roberts getting into a police squad car is real or imagined. The squad car pulls up, the police officer gets out, and just ushers Al into the car, as if Al is just picking up another ride. Uh, that is not how the police arrest someone. <laughs> and when it takes place, Al's voiceover tells us that this will happen someday. So maybe it's not really happening, but if Al sees it in his mind, perhaps he will manifest it. Regardless, the suggestion is that Al Roberts is under arrest, and the root meaning of the word arrest is to stop. Al is no longer in transit, and he will probably end up in a cell, a place that prevents him from going 
anywhere. Or if you like, his prison is his mind, his spirit. And until he can figure out a way to truly be free, there he will stay. The Hayes Code, or the Motion Picture Production Code, mandated that this scene be included in the movie because, according to the Code, murderers are not allowed to get away with their crimes. One last thing. At the end of the movie, when Al is in the Nevada diner, he tells us that he can't go to Sue because he doesn't want to burden her with this mess. He can't go back to Los Angeles because too many people would recognize him. And he can't return to New York, he says, because Al Roberts was listed as dead and had to stay dead. Uh, huh? <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, to explain that, we need to talk about the novel Detour. And while we're at it, mention other differences between the book and the movie. Detour, the novel is much darker and far more cynical than the movie. No one in this book comes out looking good. William Goldsmith wrote both the novel and the screenplay of Detour, and the movie might have been a half an hour or even an entire hour longer had it included, as the novel does, what happens to Sue Harvey in Hollywood. The novel's narration alternates chapter by chapter between Sue Harvey and Alexander Roth, a New York City violinist who might have been a great classical musician were it not for his insistence to work small-time clubs to help support his father financially. Alex's girlfriend, the singer Sue Harvey, leaves New York City for Hollywood, and the reason why Alex doesn't follow her right away is because he's poor. He only has a couple of hundred dollars in today's money to his name. In the novel, Alex doesn't get a $10 tip from an appreciative customer. He gets $10 in the mail from Sue Harvey, who can only find work in Hollywood as a waitress. When Alex decides to head west, he hitchhikes and gets arrested in Dallas, Texas for stealing some fruit. Afterward, back out on the road, he's picked up by Charlie Haskell, a bookmaker en route to Los Angeles. In the novel, Charlie doesn't take nitroglycerin pills. Uh, he smokes the reefer. <laughs> Charlie falls asleep or becomes unconscious or, or dies in the car, and when he falls out, he cracks his skull on the running board. Meanwhile, in Hollywood, Sue Harvey is chastising herself for having slept with a movie actor with the unforgettable name of Raoul Kildare. The bloom of Hollywood very quickly came off the rose for Sue Harvey. She calls Hollywood a jerkwater suburb, and despite having become so jaded, she still entertains fantasies of becoming an actress. Back to Alex, who has now assumed Charlie Haskell's identity. Alex finds in Charlie's suitcase a letter to Charlie Haskell Sr. in which Charlie claims to be in business selling hymnals and prayer books. Charlie confesses to his father that in his youth he pawned his late mother's engagement and wedding rings. Charlie asks for his father's forgiveness and says he wants to come home. Alex, reading this, has a very cynical take. He thinks Charlie only wants to ask his father for money to bet at the racetrack, even though there's no indication in the letter that this is part of Charlie's plan. It's at this point in the story that Alex Roth tells us that his birth name is Aaron Rothenberg. He had changed it in New York City back when he dreamed of becoming a classical musician. Al picks up Vera, and from that point, events in the book pretty closely mirror events in the movie, except that Alex ends up having sex with Vera. Then Alex reads in the newspaper that the police have discovered a dead body by the side of the highway in California, and the only lead is a nearby suitcase belonging to Alexander Roth. So the police believe that the dead man is Alexander Roth. 
Then Sue, in Hollywood, gets word that Alex is dead. Back to Alex and Vera. We learn that Vera is originally from Kansas City and may not have long to live. She had come to California because her doctors advised her that the change in climate might be good for her lungs. Vera wants to milk as much out of life as she possibly can, and she refuses to be anyone's sucker. Al and Vera argue about the scheme to defraud the Haskell family. Vera threatens to call the police. She gets hold of the phone, and um, Alex chokes her out. (laughs) He says in the novel... Somehow, as we struggled for the phone, her throat got in the way. Uh, no, he straight up murders her. He gets two hands around her neck and finishes her off. He calls Vera a little whore and tells us he's not sorry she's dead. He's only sorry that he killed her. Alex Roth takes the ease with which he kills another human being to mean that the universe is meaningless and human life doesn't matter. Sue, back in Hollywood, is sad, but in her words, relieved to read that Alex is dead because she decides it's Raoul that she loves. If you want to call it love, Sue Harvey, in the novel, turns out to be as much of an opportunist as Vera. She just wants to marry Raoul because... He's headed to New York for a possible acting job, and Sue sees in him stability and a future. Ah, but the minute that Sue finds out that Raoul is still married and is only separated from his wife, who uncannily happens to be Sue's roommate, she calls the whole thing off. And she finally gets a call back for a screen test, so maybe she'll be an actress after all. The book ends with Alex Roth on the run. He's given up his dreams to be a great musician, and he just goes from city to city playing hot jazz, presumably under an assumed name. And he says he can't go back to New York because everyone thinks Alexander Roth is dead. Hence the line in the movie that Al Roberts is listed as dead. Now, why Alex Roth couldn't go back to New York City and live his life as Aaron Rothenberg, uh, we do not know. <laughs> that's, that's a head-scratcher. But if you look at that line, within the context of the movie, it does add a final note of uncertainty. If the real Al Roberts from New York City is dead, then who is this guy who's been talking to us this whole time? I'm guessing that the real story here is that a scene from the movie was cut and they neglected to remove that line. Why, I don't know, because since it's in narration, I would think it would have been very easy to snip it out. Tell me what you think in the comments about that moment or about anything I've covered in this video. I absolutely appreciate your going on this ride with me for this long. My name is Tim Lemire. Thank you very much for watching.